there are times in these services that I sense that God is doing a, a deep work in the hearts of many. Some who sit here don't even know what's going on, but those whom the Lord is touching are undergoing some spiritual transformations that will affect their prayer life, will affect their walk, will affect their outlook. It's one reason we need the services, you know. And let me say this. Pastor Worley and the church have not changed. If there's been any change, it's you. Turn to the 109th Psalm and let's see why you've changed. Psalm 109, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have compassed, circled me about, also with words of hatred, fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Does that sound familiar? This is exactly what's going to happen to you when you walk with Jesus, when you dedicate yourself. You're going to find this happening to you over and over again. It isn't going to get any better. You're just going to have to learn how to depend on the Lord and believe in the Lord when these slashing attacks come. And it isn't easy. But you do learn that you don't die every time it happens. And when you first start out, you just want to throw up hands and quit every time somebody does this. Then after a while, and then then the, for and then uh, well, f at first, really you don't want to quit. Usually, you want to punch them in the nose and make them gargle with Lysol or something or liquid plumber. And um, then uh, then you get to the place where you you just get very depressed and you want to give up. And then you gradually begin to move around into God's viewpoint. And you realize that this thing has been going on for a long time and that you must expect attacks from those who move in close to you. And there's no, there's no, of course, the remedy then is to not ever get close to anybody. But you'll never do anything for God if you don't. That's what that song said. I found out that loving is well, well worth the risk. That's what Jesus said. You remember he had 10 lepers that were healed. And how many came back to praise God? One. One-tenth. And we want 100%, right? Or 80% for sure of the people that we deal with. We want them to turn and give glory to God where we can hear it. It's not enough that they go home and give glory to the Lord. We want to know about it too, right? Well, naturally, we all feel good when we hear. And I've said for years here in this church that God lets us hear enough of what's happened here that we don't know about. He lets it echo back enough of it to keep us encouraged, and he withholds a lot of it to keep us from getting all puffed up and big-headed, thinking, my, aren't we something else? Wow, what a tremendous force for God we are. We're a force for God. Well, no, we are tools in his hands. And the best thing a tool can do is to yield to the hand of the, the master craftsman. But it isn't easy, and you might as well, I think you need to understand this. You're going to find that the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongue. Now, don't kid yourself. Lie is 90% uh, or, you know, soap is 90% lie. It didn't come out right somehow, no. Well, scratch one. All right. I pulled that one down. It wasn't quite done. All right. But uh, just for that, I'll take you over, and I'll give you one that will stick, and that's over in the Old Testament. There's a verse that says, Ephraim is a cake not turned. You say, a cake not turned. I used to wonder about it. I made a face like Frank did. When I first heard that, you know, and I pick on Frank because he's down here handy. I can shoot him and hit without too much problem. Um, but um, if you'll think about it, did you ever did you ever make hotcakes? 
you like them cooked on both sides? You say, well, certainly. But well, see, if you think about Ephraim, a cake not turned, think of a hot cake that's nice and done on one side, but it's all yicky yicky on top. That's the way some people are. They're a cake not turned. They're half-baked. I have a whole message somewhere I used to have on half-baked Christians. Cake not turned. And a lot of, now the half-baked ones are the ones that always st start out to straighten out the ministry and the preacher. They're the ones that know it all. They have, they have not, never pastored a church, never had a call to preach. They have never even proven themselves to be a, be a stead, steadfast Christian. But boy, they know all the answers. They can correct everybody who's been on the trail, that's for sure. And uh, the funny thing is, you see, the longer you're on the trail, the more you begin to be reticent and you begin to be more dependent on the Lord and realize, well, you know, uh, maybe we put it on hold. Uh, the cake not turned... One reason they're half-baked is because they don't want to take time cooking God's oven. They're the quickie jobs, you know. They're like owl steaks. When he orders steak, I've heard him tell the waitress, she said, how would you like it cooked? He said, kill it. I might have talked to him about eating blood one of these days, but at any rate... The cake not turned just hasn't taken time to get done. Did you ever bite into a hot cake or a pancake that wasn't done? Now, you know, it doesn't taste, well, yeah, it does. It tastes yucky, doesn't it? And it's not what a pancake's supposed to talk about. And a lot of people are half-baked. They speak with lying tongues, and they open their mouth with deceit, they go around deceiving people. They deceive themselves first. You have to deceive yourself to make you think make you think you're as smart as you think you are. Because everybody else stands in awe and wonder and says, well, how stupid can you be? And we have people come in this church every once in a while, and, and they think everybody in here is an idiot starting at the pulpit. I know they do because they come around and they give me these stories. And I say, oh, really? Is that right? They think, well, that old man, he's stupid. He doesn't you put anything over on him, you know. Don't you believe it. You'd be surprised how big the file 13 in my mind is, where we cast away all of that which is junk and garbage. But I will listen, I will check and consider, but that doesn't mean I'm accepting by long shot. And they go to other people, and they think people in this church are so stupid, they'll be taken in, too. We've had some people stop cold here. They went into deliverance, and one lady I heard about started riddling down the wrong trail, and one of our gals said, hush, I don't want to hear that. Good for you, Deborah. See, I get good reports back on the people, too. Stand your ground, honey. You were right. You just, the people around here are not stupid. And this is an awfully bad place to come into and try to deceive. There's too many antennas up going beep, 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 check, check. Ooh, bing, 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 doom. Dud, 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 dud. That buzzing you hear in your head, maybe it's all the antennas pointing at you saying, oops, there's one. I remember I can talk about it now he's dead. Gone to heaven, he knows better now, Alice. You remember one time uh, your husband came here and uh, was at the little church? Well, he happened to walk in, and I was in a particularly refreshing mood. And I plowed corn from Dan to Beersheba. I chunked planks, pews, and everything else. And he sat there just about to die. Because everything he'd been doing or not doing, I was ripping apart. Well, I didn't know he hadn't been in church in ages. He didn't know it was here, but said by rumor. And, I mean, Alice told him it was still going. She is here. And he turned on her on the way home. He said, you told Brother Worley about me. You talked to Pastor Worley about me. And he preached on me tonight. She looked at him and she said, Gene, I haven't talked to Pastor in two or three weeks. And I have never talked to him about anything. 
He said, but Gene, you might as well make up your mind. You can't fake it at Hagwish. Said, the people know. They just know. And they'll give you every opportunity. And they're not going to kick you out because they know you're a stinker and a rotten egg and a uh, sour turnip or anything like that. But they're, they're not going to let you get, get away with it. They'll start praying for you. And said, you just might as well take that as from God because that's where it came from. Of course, I think Alice sat there and enjoyed it because she knew where it fit. But uh, you did enjoy it a little, didn't you, Alice? Just a teeny, just a little bit. Yeah, I thought so. But it's true that she hadn't talked to me at all. But the Lord had. And uh, it's amazing how many times people come up to me. Uh, sometimes five or six people come up and say, that letter, that sermon was just for me. I said, oh, really? Yes, I don't know how you knew, but I, you know, and five different people from five different walks of life, five different sets of circumstances, there's no way except by the power of the Holy Spirit that could happen. What I'm saying is, is this red hot shoe fits that I'm going to fit you with this morning, wear it. If it pinches your bunions and corns, get rid of them. Don't kick the shoe. There's nothing wrong with the shoe. It's wrong with your feet. If you smell an odor, wash them. Don't say that old shoe stinks. It's not the shoe, friend. It's you. And with those choice little remarks, we'll proceed. The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceit. You say, well, why are you doing this? We're, we're, we're going along fine. Because I want you inoculated against this kind of garbage when it starts. And I don't care who's spewing it off. When it's coming out of the mouth of the deceitful and the mouth of the wicked, why are they wicked? Because they are coming against the work of God. And they're speaking presumptuously and ignorantly. David prayed in the Psalms, preserve me from presumptuous sins. Don't let me presume. One of the biggest sins in the country today is presumptuous sin. People presume on God. They presume on his mercy. They presume on his grace. They presume on me. Every once in a while, though, they get a shock. I can use the shock treatment occasionally. There's no other way. It's just like, you know, if, if a mad dog's charging you, I'd stand there and bind, bind spirits, but if that didn't work, I'd pull the trigger on that gun. Boule! See if we can stop him that way. And I want you inoculated against this, knowing that these things will come and knowing where they're coming from and so that you'll not get disheartened. This is standard procedure. I've been preaching more than half of my life. About two-thirds of my life I've been preaching. Almost. And... Uh, I'm just telling you, this is standard treatment for those walking with God. Those who are walking outside the will of God and outside of the knowledge of God are going to be the stinkers who will speak with the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful, and they will lie. Sometimes they know they're lying, sometimes they don't. Some people tell lie so much until they don't know the difference between lying and the truth. A lot of people lie, so they tell the same lie over and over again, and they convince themselves, and they can take a lie detector test and, and pass it as, uh, because they've convinced themselves it's true. And you have to watch out for this, too. There are people who will come around and tell you things. Well, what do you think about this? Well, do you agree with this? Do you, what do you think about this, that, and the other? And you kind of noncommittal. You think, well, I never even thought much about it. Well, I, I don't know. Well, I think so and so and so and so. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I don't know. When they leave you, they'll go and say, so and so said, and they'll quote their lies and put them in your mouth. That's why you have to be careful about getting mad at some of your brothers and sisters when you hear, hear that I hear that I hear that I heard. Hmm? Check it out. Now, they've spoken against me with a lying tongue. They lied. Either they know they're lying and they're doing it on purpose, or they don't know they're lying, and that's even worse because they ought to get straight with God, then they know when they're lying. Amen? 
or old me, whichever one fits. Put away these lying things. Some of us are sitting there saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not in the middle. Well, that's right. The only people getting uncomfortable, well, you know, if there was about eight or ten dogs milling around out here in our parking lot, and I tossed a rock over in the middle of them, and one went, which one would you think hollered? You say, the hip dog hollers, that's right. So if I were you, I'd be very quiet about this message. I mean, I wouldn't even tell my wife or my husband or my best friend. If they, uh, you say, how'd you like the message? Fine, fine. Because otherwise they're going to spot you because I'm, I'm letting you know now you're the cornball. If it's pinching you, it's, there's only one reason. It's because it fits. You're welcome. You say, I didn't come in here for that. Well, you're getting it anyhow. And if you leave now, everybody will know it's you. You say, that's, that's dirty politics, preacher. Yeah, it is. I've learned a few things in all these years, you know. When you're going to preach something that can be unpleasant, fix it so they can't even leave without giving away who they are. <laughs> and we've only begun. Wait till I get to the pepper pot. We haven't got to the best part yet. These are only the preliminary sweetnesses. I'm putting the sweetening in now. They compass me about with words of hatred, fought against me without a cause. You have to realize that people don't have to have a reason to come against you. The hatred that they have can come from many things. A lot of times hatred comes from jealousy. We've had some lying, slandering remarks. Besides, oh, of course, I'm the prime target. I'm bigger than anybody else. I'm easier to hit, you see. I stick out on all sides of the pulpit and turn, get Dennis up here and turn him sideways. You'd have to be a pretty good marksman to hit him. But uh, and Keith, I'm telling you, you'd never hit him if he turned sideways. But, <laughs> but um, some like me that are the large family size, uh, you can hardly miss. You know, you've got to hit something. But even some of our other people that have stood in this place have been the, the butt of a lot of hatred. And that hatred comes, the boys who stand up here, and the, well, my wife keeps saying, honey, they are not boys. And I say, well, they had no business coming here when they were such kids. To me, they're boys. When you get to be 62, you can call everybody boys. Now, is that un we got that all straightened out? The boys who stand up here behind this place, the men who stand here, often get hit. And uh, for you who stand up here and you get hit for trying to bring a message, trying to, to do something to help and be constructive, don't get all bent out of shape about it because a lot of that's coming out of hatred. And there's a wicked spirit called image of jealousy that doesn't want to do it. They don't want to do it themselves, but they get mad when somebody else does it. Now, I even have trouble when Joe gets up here and preaches good sermons. That image of jealousy comes to me and says, you're going to let him preach again? First thing you know, they'll love him as good as they love you. So I caution all these men that preach. I take them off every once in a while and I give them a little uh, fatherly talk. I say, now, when you preach, I want you to do moderately well. But don't get up there and just show out. And preach so good that everybody thinks you're better than I am. Just keep in mind, I am the top honcho. Now that image of jealousy causes people to come against those in the pulpit. And especially if they preach things that hurt. And that uncover. And that make me uncomfortable. Well, I'll just think of something about him. I don't like the way he looks. I don't like the way he stood. Talk too long, talk too short. Anything but facing the issue that the thing that really got you upset was the content and God was getting your britches and tearing them up. He was getting after you. So you've got to learn to be honest and analyze why are you reacting. 
And this hatred will come out of envy and jealousy. And you'll hate them without a cause. People who've done nothing to offend you, if you let these demons get hold of you, they will cause you to attack them, to castigate them, to talk about them, to slander them, to slur them. And let me warn you about that. God will take your hide off and salt you down for that. You better keep your big flappy mouth shut until God can give you understanding. Don't you come against people who stand up and preach God's word unless they are just completely in heresy. But I'm talking about men who give a good job. And all in the world's wrong is you're jealous and you're envious. And you think they're closer to the pastor than I am. And they're closer to this one and they're close. Baloney. My office is open. Sometimes it resembles a gathering of the nuts. Full of big old ugly men in there. I even let women in once in a while. Even though I hate women. That's one of my, that's one of my labels, you know. Whirly hates women. And that's another lie that goes around. I don't hate women. I just want them to do what God wants them to do. And uh, Ruthann, you used to believe that, didn't you? She used to be scared to death. Now then, she's so brave, she just tells people, oh, go in there and see him. They say, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now some of you guys are laughing and you were the same way. Do you thought... Do you found out that those those things, those rumors about me growing long yellow fangs and leaping on a woman and tearing her flesh out of her arms to punish her were not true? Why do I spend so much time with these big ugly men? Because you gals can't handle them. I can chew them up and spit them out. And they'll take it from me. They won't take it from you. You say, good, I'm going to load mine up and send him in there. He needs some chewing and spitting. All right, send him on. <laughs> but jealousy and envy will cause people to come against for no cause, no real cause. When you start feeling animosity and irritation towards somebody, start analyzing why you feel that way. Why you feel it's your job to go around and clean everything up. There's a lot of people, you know, they they um, they feel called to pastor this church. I know they do because they assume all the pastoral duties. And they take it on themselves to do a lot of things that have nothing to do with what they're supposed to be doing. One time... I'll move it away from here. It's getting kind of warm in here. I'll, I'll uh, you, the way you do that now, fellows, you you preachers, let me give you a tip. When thing, when the temperature gets to, up to the boiling point, and the lid's fixing to blow. What you do, you pick an illustration from the past, far removed. Then the people can relax. Say, oh, good, he's not going to talk about me. He's going to talk about somebody else. <laughs> and um, but be sure the illustration is apropos. I was pastoring in church in Louisiana one time. And there was a lady call me. Uh, oh, did she ever call me? You remember Peggy, honey? Now my wife's saying, oh, Lord. And, <laughs> and she would always call me and she'd say, Brother Worley, she said, I don't know why these girls call me. They, um, and so and so called me and they just said, happy stuff, happy stuff, happy stuff. I said, Peggy, that's nothing for you to have to even fool with. I said, why didn't you give her my phone number and tell her to call the pastor? Well, I, I did tell her. And every time you turn around, and I said, she shouldn't be dumping that garbage on you. I said, put the lid on your can. Tell her we're not receiving garbage today. You call the preacher and talk to him. I'm not qualified. It's none of my business. And he's the one you ought to be talking to anyhow about this. And, and it was always two or three had called her. They just kept calling her and calling her. Well, I finally got a little suspicious. I couldn't understand why they were so drawn to this lady. 
So I went around just quietly and went to two or three of the ladies that had been talking to her. Guess what? They didn't call her. She called them. And she called them and said, what do you think about so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? Oh, really? Well, I don't like so-and-so. What about? What do you think about it? And she'd, she'd put her own views on them and then call me and say, they called me and told me this. You think I didn't fire her hide from the pulpit? Well, I tried talking to her and she didn't listen, so I just let, I thought, well, I'll just inoculate the congregation so they'll know. There was another couple in the church that had a bad habit of carrying tails. This man and his wife. And they'd pick up something and they'd carry it. Well, they were carrying some stuff that was absolutely false. It was causing a lot of heartache to some of the people. And it wasn't, there wasn't anything to it. So I called the man and his wife in and I talked to them and I gave them the straight of the story. I said, now this is the way it really is. And I said, so please don't go around and tell anybody else this because now you know the truth and don't tell anybody else this. He left my office and drove not even a half a mile. And he was sitting in the kitchen telling the same old story over again. That I just branded and proved to him beyond the shadow of doubt it was a pack of lies and should never be repeated at all. And here he is spewing it out again. You see, some people are compulsive liars. That's why you can't get them to shut up. You can sit and prove to them over and over again that what they're saying is a pack of lies and they'll turn right around and the next person they see, they'll dump on them too. Now, the only thing, only hope for them is deliverance. And one of the things they need to be delivered of is me. Because there comes a time when I get sick and tired of it and uh, don't think that I can't tell somebody where the door is because I can there comes a limit to all things and a limit to spewing out things that have been proven, checked, cross-checked, and proven to be lies. And then if, you, if people go on spreading them, it's time for action. And don't ever underestimate me. I can be mean as a snake when it's necessary to protect the flock. And you people out there that they're spewing it off to, just don't. Just tell them, if you keep telling me this stuff, I'm going to go tell the pastor that you're still talking this stuff. Try that. I guarantee you, <laughs> they'll pull their feelers in in a hurry. They, won't, they don't want to meet Papa Bear. Because Papa Bear can be nasty when it comes to the sheep. You can, you can chew me up and spit me out, and I'll get you hiding for that. But not near as bad as I will. Or you're doing something to damage the sheep. Just don't do it. And don't allow other people to do it in front of you. When they start out with that stuff, just like Deborah did, the case that was relayed to me, somebody started dumping on her. When she was supposed to be praying for them, they started dumping a bunch of stuff that was inappropriate and shouldn't have been said. And she said, I don't want to hear it. You can bet the lady didn't get any deliverance because she wasn't in looking for deliverance. She's looking for another dump can. And if everybody here puts the lid on their garbage can when they come by, pretty soon they'll leave and hunt another garbage dump. And they'll get the idea that nobody wants to collect their garbage. And remember this, if you keep receiving other people's garbage and you keep encouraging them to dump on you, you're going to have the infestation and the puke and the stench and the horror around your own household and your own life can be fouled up with it. Just don't do it. If it's bad, throw the ball to me. I've had a lot more experience in handling it than you have. And if they won't come and talk to me, they don't really want help. You can mark that down. They're not really that hot and, uh, to, to get help. Pitch it to me. I'm not afraid of it. I've handled more hot potatoes than you have. I'll guarantee you this, I haven't flinched or backed off from any either. A lot of times when I started out, I didn't know what I was going to say, but I said, okay, Lord, here we go. 
you lead the way and I'll follow. And a lot of times he went through like flamethrower. He burned everything in, in path. But when we got through, there was some clearance. Some of you sitting here, you know you've been in the flamethrower in there when the flamethrower was going. I know one time I was talking to somebody who came in here. They're not here. Now, you, you can relax. This is not somebody's here. <laughs> they lit briefly. Uh, but I was in there, and I had occasion. We checked and cross-checked, and this thing was spreading poison. I called him in on the carpet. There were a couple of fellows there. I don't remember. I remember Dan was in there. I don't remember who else was in there. I know Dan was in there. He was, he was trying to get out the door. And somebody else, uh, two other guys said they were in the hall and they heard it and they didn't want to get anywhere close to the door even. And I guarantee you one thing, I put a stop to what he was doing. Dan told me, he said, I, it wasn't even against me and I felt like crawling under the couch. On the other hand, I can be sweet and quite understanding. It's only with those who just deliberately refuse help and refuse to go by Bible principles, that's when I shell the corn for them. And you got to do that. A leader has to be willing to do that. See, a leader is not worth his salt if he won't call a halt or something of this stuff. That's why some people can never be a leader because, well, I hate to hurt their feelings, not me. If I hate to hurt them, you'll never notice. You'll never notice. Listen to my wife chuckling over there. She's... <laughs> She's heard me on the phone sometimes, and when I'd hang up, she'd say, Good night, honey. I said, Well, they had no business doing that. I'd warned them and warned them. I said, I'm tired of it now. They better quit. I've said my last. That's it. She said, Yes, if they don't understand that, they don't understand English. That's for sure. I can put it in words of one syllable. I mean, if you have difficulty with my adjectives, I can reduce it down to basic English so that you will know exactly what I mean. Most of you who know me at any time at all, you know the thing that brings me out fighting is when the flock's in danger. You can chew on my hide and help yourself. You'll probably break your fangs off. I've had tougher people than you bite on me and break their teeth. You're not likely to bother me a great deal. I've developed a rhinoceros hide. You say, well, you look like one too. Well, you don't do a whole lot for me either, just between us, but... Uh, we won't go into that. I'm just thinking about some funny people I've seen. <laughs> First, we better go on uh, before this gets out of hand. Uh, verse 4, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. This is the thing that's the hardest of all. When all that you've done is to pour out love to these people and understanding and trying to help them with their problems and they turn and repay you this way. He said, for, for my love, this is how they, help, they reward you. And notice you give yourself to prayer. How do you float? You give yourself to prayer. You throw it to the Lord. You put the ball in the Lord's court. There is no way you can keep from becoming bitter, angry, if you hang on to it yourself. You've got to pitch it in the Lord's court. And there's a, you say, well, I don't know how to do that. I'll give you the switch the way you do it. I'll give you a real, uh, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. These other people may not care for you, but he cares for you and you can cast all your care on him. Because he does care for you. Now, uh, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him. Ooh, that's not very loving. But when a person gets out of order like this and they won't listen to reason and they react to love with hatred and lies and deceit, and wickedness, what do you do? Pray. What do you pray? Set a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. Ooh. Oh, 
That wouldn't be so terrible. Yeah. But it might, it just might shake some sense in that stupid head. It just might. Right now they have air between their ears. It might even crank the brain up and get it working again so they can think instead of just acting on the impulse of demons. This is warfare. Remember, look, look how much this, this character has done already. The mouth of the wicked, the mouth of the deceitful are raised against me, spoken against, they lie, they circle him about with words of hatred, and they fight against him without a cause for their, because I loved them, they become my adversaries, and I give myself to prayer, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So now he prays and says, set a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand, and when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. I think this is what Paul was thinking about when he delivered those boys up. Remember? He delivered some up to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. They were saved. But boy, when uh, the, the flesh was going to go, go, uh, go out of business, he delivered them up for the destruction of the flesh. You see, there's a lot of molly coddly, syrupy, Saccharine, sweet, love, 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 running around. And you just love everybody. You just love the devil and you just, you just kiss his horns if you want to. Bless his little old heart, just little understanding, he'd probably come right across. Oh, you bet he'll come across. He'll load you up for bear. You've got to learn to hate those that God hates. He hates the demonic host. And you have to stand against those demonic hosts. And this they're calling for this person to be judged and let him be condemned and let his very prayer become sin. A lot of these birds are sanctimonious prayer, prayers, you know. Oh, God, oh, what you get through that world, he just won't listen. He won't listen to all my glorious words of wisdom. Oh, God, well, don't you aim them at me. I'll throw them back. I'll pray, God, let his prayer become sin. You know, I find out you praying like that for me, I'll get you. See, I've been walking around in this Bible for a good while. And I've got a lot of arrows I hadn't shot yet. But if somebody tempts me, I'll draw them out and try them out. I'm always in favor of trying out new warfare. Check it out. And it's especially nice if people are close by, you can check the effects, you know. If you shoot them long distance, you never do know for sure. So I mean, it takes you a while to find out whether they hit or not. But if somebody close by, you know, you can find out in a hurry. You better watch your stuff. Let his days be few. Let him die quick. That's what they're talking about. And let another take his office. Let him lose his position. You better watch out. You lose, you, you lose your position. Let another take his office means let him take another, another take his position. You may have a very secure place financially, you think. I've got news for you. That can be sucked down the tube so quick, you won't have anything left. You'll be left staring at salvation in the face. If somebody begins to work on you this way, if you put this bill up here, you need to be stripped. You need to be judged. You need to be condemned. Why? Because you are stupid and ignorant and mean and hateful and you will not listen. When you turn on people that love you and do them hatred. And you men and women better listen. When you turn on your husbands and wives and do this, you better listen. You better listen. Let his days be few. You can shorten your life. Let another take his office. You get down flat on your back, you'll shut your fool mouth. 
When you just look up, the only way you can look up and God say, mm-hmm, hello. Long time since I've seen you. You've been busy this way, you see. I haven't been looking up much. Well, he can put you flat on your back where you can look up. That's not the only reason people get flat on the back, but that's one reason. And if you fit these other qualifications, if I were you, I'd check up before you check out. Let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. Friend, that's talking about death. Let him die because he's not fit to live. Let his wife become a widow. His children become orphans. They'll be better off without that turkey. If he is fitting the bill that's described above here, he is doing so much damage to his children, it'd be a blessing if God would get him out of the way and release his poor wife from the, me the mess of having to live with him. Some of you men are looking at me real serious now. Why don't you just think about it? See, a lot of people are treading on thin ice and they don't know what they're fooling with. You don't fool with God. God knows what he's doing. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he has and let strangers spoil his labor. You talk about severe praying, but this is, this is rough stuff. He's talking about people being wiped out who depend on the things they've garnered. My wife was reading a new book we've got, and she read a significant statement. He said, in our society, we've made a bad mistake. We love things and use others. We should use things and love others. We've got it completely backwards. And the users in this world fit the pattern of this. They're using people as cat's paws. They're trying to manipulate and control people. And if you've got that, you better get rid of that control spread because it's going to kill you. Especially if you run across people that know the Bible. If all they have to do is put a crossfire of scriptures on you and you're dead. You're dead while you live. At first you have to die by losing everything you've got because that's what you worship anyhow. So you lose everything you've got so you have nothing to worship. And all that pride will be humble to the dirt. And notice this, let none extend mercy to him, let, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. That's a horrible legacy to pass on to your young ones, fellow. This is how God looks at it. If the father is a low-down snake, he can pass on to his children the fate of being vagabond, that's somebody who just roams around and cannot settle down anywhere and also he takes away favor that people would extend toward his orphan children. Gals, you better think a whole lot before you pick that ugly thing to be the uh, father of your youngins. Because if he's like this, he's going to mess you up and mess your children up. Does that make sense? You say, well, I don't know why you preach so hard, preacher. I'm just telling you what's here. Have I added to what God says? I'm telling you what's in here. It's a serious business to be crossways with God and to be crossways with God's people. You'd do well to learn to take it a little bit instead of flaring up every time you're a little <laughs> Just lay down and let it roll. Let it go by. Rather than come under these kind of judgments. These are, these are heavy, heavy judgments. Let his posterity be cut off and the, in the generation following let their name be blotted out. He said let his kids be sterile and not even reproduce his name on the face of the earth anymore. That's going pretty far. Mm -hmm. 
I remind you, I am not adding to the scripture. I'm just saying what it says here. This is what this is God's word, not mine. Now, verse 14, let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Wow. And we know a little bit about the sins of the fathers, the sins of the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. And he said, when a person pursues this, don't even let those sins be blotted out. Let them come down on him. Boom. And what... What a hellish state this would be to live in something like this. How much better to come to terms with God? Throw that stupid pride overboard, throw that oversized ego out the window, and let the air out of that inflated intellect and face the fact that you're just a dummy like everybody else who has to learn the ways of God from God's word and has to learn how to yield to God and walk with Jesus. You say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, I want you to know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with some of these things. When you're dealing with this kind of thing. Some of you are sitting there thinking, thinking thank God. A few months or a few years ago, that would have caught me broadside. Oh, boy, am I glad. I've got things straightened out. And I'm on my way with the Lord. Amen? Don't you see how serious it is when people cross up with the Lord? Uh, we're going to have to stop. I think our time's just about gone. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. God detests this kind of thing so much, he wants to cut them off from the earth, the memory that they ever walked on the earth. Wow. That's pretty strong stuff. Because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. They'll catch somebody who's broken heart and jump right on their back and hurt them instead of help them. You better watch your step. You better watch your step. As he loved cursing, they'll curse other people by praying against them, by talking against them. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighteth not in blessing, so let it be far from him. He didn't want blessing, let the blessings flee from him. He loves cursing, let them come back on him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as his, with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil in his bone. I mean, he's talking about a saturation process. A saturation with curses. Because he covered himself with curses like a garment. Let it be unto him as the garment that covers him for a girdle wherewith he's girded continually. And that is... Put it on him like a garment and tighten it up good and tight with that girdle so he can't shake it loose. He's stuck with it. Let this be with the reward of my adversaries from the Lord and them that speak evil against my soul. I guess he didn't know that she's supposed to love everybody, even the devil, and kiss their boots a little if it'll help reconcile them to God. No, he didn't go that way. He went a different route. But do thou for me, O God, the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. I am poor and needy. My heart is wounded within me. I am gone like the shadow when it declines. I am tossed up and down like a locust. My knees are weak, though fasting. Through fasting my flesh faileth of fatness. I became also a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shook their heads. They said, oh boy. <laughs> Help me, O Lord my God, and O save me according to thy mercy, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, hast done it. Let them curse, but bless thou. In other words, let them curse me, but you bless me. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. Mine adversaries be clothed with shame, 
Let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle, and I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn his soul. Now we have a family in our midst right now who are under a heavy, heavy attack from witchcraft. Let me commend that psalm to you heavily to read and meditate on it and come right down the middle of the line. And you thought you didn't have any ammunition? I just loaded your guns. Let them have it. Those who insist on living in wickedness deserve every rotten thing they get. Those who will not listen, those who, who uh, hate those that love them and reach out to them and help, they deserve every one of these things. Now, aren't you glad you weren't sitting in the path of the broadside? It's better to see it shoot over your head, right? Go somewhere else. But at least you know how God feels about this stuff, and you won't have to be namby-pamby and afraid to take your grounds and stand pat against these evil people who just continually go against all this. Read the qualifications very carefully, and then if they fit the qualifications, let them have it. Take the verses and pray right down through them. Say, Lord, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, right here. Just like you said in your word. I feel like the psalmist did. These boys fit the bill up here, and I fit the bill down here, so praise God. Now, don't try to cash a check where you haven't got any money. Okay? Be sure you fit the bill, and they fit the bill before you start sliding it in place. It won't work. But if it works, everywhere the slot fits and you fit, shoot. And good hunting. I plan to do some hunting myself at the camp meeting. I'll have some time and I'm going to do some meditation on this one. I'm going to load some salvos and check out some weaponry myself and see how effective it is. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, you're probably frightened by now. But... <laughs> Hopefully you are. <laughs> but if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, you're not sure that you have, wouldn't you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. I was thinking about somebody getting frightened because they, by this time you should be. You should see that the Lord is dealing severely with these things. If you haven't got this thing straightened up, by all means, come forward. The invitation. Just tell the ones who are coming up, the uh, ones who are receiving up here at the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. And a worker will be assigned to you to sit down and talk with you personally about this area with the Bible. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented. This is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. Then you're talking about the work of demons, and they must be cast out in Jesus' name. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. We believe in all these things. These are signs following the believers. And so we encourage you to come. We have many trained workers here who can help you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And when the invitation starts, if you need prayer in any of these areas, by all means, come you say, how can I know I have demons? They drive, they harass, they torment, they produce compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. Come down the center aisles here, two lines, and you'll get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, worker right away, as quickly as possible, when you start the invitation. In you win, I'm going to give the way. Me to live, I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. Oh, I could never, never love my Lord. Jesus showed us that only through dying we live, and he gave.
when it seemed there was no more to give. Oh, he loved me when loving brought heartache and loss. He forgave me from an old rugged cross. I'm going to
here and around the world. Let's stand up and sing that chorus one more time. And this time I want you to just sing it to the Lord, okay? Just to really close your eyes, shut everybody else out, and just sing it to the Lord from the bottom of your heart, okay? I love you.